what happens. Okay, we are working. Amanda Billy Rock, I am speaking to you, and you are in New Zealand. I am. So that's extraordinary. I don't think I've ever spoken to anybody in live video from New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, you know, there are palm trees and hibiscus flowers out my window, and it's awesome weather, and yeah, it's great. Now, the whole thing comes as this, something of a shock. How am I doing? Am I cutting up yet? Or am I, am I, as my... Uh, nope, you're solid so far. Okay. So it comes as, as a shock, which is why I wanted to interview you, because... I mean, you're kind of an epic figure. I mean, you played this huge role in, you know, the libertarian world over the last two years, and now it's like you're gone. I and I just there without an announcement or anything. I mean, what's going on? Um. Yeah, I knew a few months ago, uh, late last year, that I really wanted to get out that I needed to get out. Um, I've had a couple of really bad police experiences. Um, I've been arrested unjustly. And yeah, I just, once the checkpoints started coming in out on the freeways, and once um, the TSA fully, like, I've had so many pat downs, um, but the last two I had, like they literally said to me, Okay, I will now run my hands up your legs until they meet resistance on the inside. I mean, like, the euphemisms government can come up with are truly brilliant. <laughs> and so, yeah, after enough things like that happened, I was like, I, I truly have to go. And so I just did a bunch of research, and when I found out that New Zealand cops didn't carry guns, like, it did not take that much more convincing to get me here. Well, you know, our ancestors in the 19th century, they move away from, well, in the 18th century, they move away from places where things were controlled to places where things are less controlled, right? Seeking freedom. And that seems like more or less what you're doing. Yeah, it is. Um, it's, it's so interesting because there's like, they call it like the underground railroad here of American expats coming in. <laughs> And there are, like, local libertarians here who are like, hey, guys, you want to come be friends with us? Like, welcome. Like, let us help you out and show you around. And thankfully, I have fallen into contact with them, which is super awesome. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there are always trade-offs to where you live. I mean, it's laid back here, but it's also super expensive. It's like, in U.S. dollars, it's like $8 for a watermelon, stuff like that. Like, it's really spendy. But to me, the trade-offs so far are worth it. I've, I've heard, though, that the, uh, that the, uh, the, if you get a, a job, and I understand you're looking for one now, um, that, uh, that the wages are high. Am I right about that? Um, I mean, if you're talking state-approved jobs, the minimum wage is 13-something an hour. In U.S. dollars, that's like 11-something an hour. Um, so as for whether the wages truly balance out the cost of living, I kind of have yet to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. But the main thing is that, so how does it make you feel? I know that's a kind of a, a funny uh, question, but um, do you feel um, freer? You know, I don't know if the cop cars are like this where you live, but back where I'm from, uh, they drive Dodge Chargers now, like big black Dodge Chargers, some of them with like what I swear are racing stripes going down them, you know, with those giant grill guards and the cops always resting their hands on all of their weapons and their right. belt and their their boots and always acting like super intimidating. Like the cop cars here are like dinky and white. And they have little blue and yellow checkers on them. And the guys aren't carrying guns. And it's like, maybe I talk about cops too much. But yeah, when I see that, I do feel freer. I do. I, I felt that way when I traveled even to Spain and, and to Vienna and uh, Brazil. Uh, a sense <laughs> of freedom that I didn't feel here. Isn't it strange? It's like it kind of slips away. 
you know, and then you sort of get used to the new normal. And then it's shocking to travel abroad. And you realize, oh, so this is what it feels like to be able to sort of do what you want to do. Yeah, I got my work permit within a week, applied for it and had it within a week. Um, and I actually bought a scooter a couple of days ago to get myself around. And like my license from the States totally works here. Like as long as I live here under 12 months, I don't have to get one of their licenses. Um, and like insurance on my bike wasn't compulsory. So I didn't have to go buy insurance. And um, when I bought it, we didn't have to like go line up at the DMV for two hours to do the registration and changing of ownership. We did it online in five minutes for a grand total of seven US dollars. And just, I just feel like more welcome here a little bit. You know, of course there's still a state, there's still a giant state apparatus here. And it's even weirder because they're like in a way connected to England still. I mean, even the flag has, you know, the English flag inset into it. Hmm. And so, yeah, I certainly haven't escaped the state in any way, but I'm not as scared here. And I feel like I'm treated more humanely by the state. And are there other American young people? You mentioned a, a, a kind of growing liberty movement and an underground railroad. <laughs> I mean, so you're finding people your age who, young Americans? Um, okay, so I've only been here for two weeks, so I've not met that many people at all. Mm -hmm. um, but of the libertarians I have met so far, they're probably more in like their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, I'm definitely on the young end, but I haven't met that many people. So Yeah, and what's, how cool is it that you can nowadays, or maybe just take this for granted, but to me it's amazing that you can move to a new place 20 years ago, if you had moved to a new place, you would have been isolated for a very long time. Now, there's a network already in place, right? And you can find people and they can find you. You know, that, I mean, every day, my appreciation for the internet is just like flowers and flowers and flowers. I found these people by um, joining meetup.com. Do you know, are you familiar with meetup.com? Of course. Yeah, so I just went on meetup.com and I joined the Bitcoin group. Um, the Texas Hold'em group, the, pa <laughs> the paleo eating group, and the salsa group. And um, when I joined the salsa group, I got a message from their leader, and he's like, I saw you joined my paleo group too. And I was like, no way. And he said, yeah, you know, if I were to start one more group, it would be an Austrian economics group. And I said, shut up, get out. Who are you and how have you followed me? And so, yeah, I found these people through meetup.com. It's freaking awesome. Um, Amanda, can you backtrack just a little bit and tell me about your life over the last two years? Yes. <laughs> Interesting that you choose two years. Um, it was almost two years ago exactly that um, I was kind of blissfully ignorant of most things. Um, and it was always the talk about the economy being bad. And I was just like, what does this even mean? You know, it was on the television and the radio. And I'm just like, apparently this is very important and very large. So I should probably figure it out what an economy is and what's more, how it can go bad. What, like, it's like rotten fruit. Like, how does something go bad? And so I just started looking into things. I literally went to the local library and just started looking for books on economics um, and one of the featured books in the library that day was called A Failure of Capitalism, subtitled something like an, ex an explanation of the 2008 meltdown. And I thought, I'll read it. I'll totally read it on the contingency that I get a book with an opposing view. And so I went to the, the section, uh, I don't even remember what it was called, but the book I found was called Radicals for Capitalism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so I thought, I have one for either side, and I'll go home and give them both a go. So, of course, one made sense, and the other totally did not. And the one that made sense used the word libertarian, which I I don't know if I'd ever even heard the word at that point. And so I Googled libertarian, up came Ron Paul, and that's how it all started. And you got very involved in the campaign at some, at some level. 
Oh my gosh. When I, when I stumbled upon the whole thing, when I first started YouTubing, you know, speeches, Ron Paul, and I remember like, um, one of his first lectures or speeches or whatever that I found online, it so excited me. It gave me so much hope that I, I emailed it to everybody I knew, every aunt, every uncle, every cousin, every workmate I had ever had. And I said, watch this and gain the hope that I have gained. It's so wonderful, you know, because he was talking about sound money and ending the drug war and taking nonviolent people out of prison. And to me, it was just like, oh my God, I have stumbled upon life. Like this is, this is my religion. Freedom is my religion. And when I got a really, really lukewarm response from almost everyone I had emailed it to, I thought something's wrong. Something's wrong that this message is not exciting that many people. And so I need to help do something about that. Um, and so I... The videos thing started by accident. Um, I went to a youth for Ron Paul meeting, and we watched this YouTube video from these people who wanted to fly someone to Iowa for the Iowa Republican primaries to give a stump speech for Ron Paul. And so they were asking for uploads of sample stump speeches, then they would choose from among them and give that person the airfare to go to Iowa to give a stump speech for Ron Paul. And so I was like, you know, I really don't want to put myself on the internet because I think that's embarrassing, but I really want to go to Iowa. And so I uploaded the my little video and I didn't realize you could make it private. And I also didn't realize that anyone other than the contest holders would see it. Right. I don't know how anyone saw it and started passing, passing it around. I have no idea. Um, but yeah, I, people started contacting me saying, make more. I subscribed to you. And I said, okay, if it'll help Ron Paul win, okay. And that's how it happened. And then it was more and more and more. And the last time you and I saw each other, we were on Adam Kokesh's uh, show yeah. um, together. So you began to, were you often a co-host or you just showed up that evening? Um, so I ended up being signed by um, a company called Maker Studios. They represent YouTube talent and as far as like our advertising and whatnot. And shortly after they signed me, they signed Adam. And okay. so uh, we were always seeing each other's work that way. Um, and so when I realized that I was ready to head out of the States, um, I, I guess I wanted to see if there was any one last project that I could, you know, go for yeah. before I left the U.S. liberty scene entirely. Yeah. And so I contacted Adam and I was like, hey, what are you doing? Can, yeah. we, can we do something? Yeah. And he said, you know, I actually need a co-host. Do you want to come stay in D.C.? It's free rent. And cool. I was like, see you next week. Yeah. And so that's how it happened. So how long were you co-hosting? Uh, just about three weeks. Three weeks, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was just like a temporary guest thing. So, Amanda, as as people are watching this, I mean, there's a number of emotions that I feel. One is a great sense of sadness that you're gone. I mean, it shouldn't. This shouldn't be happening. Actually, I'm happy for you, and I'm happy for New Zealand, but it makes me sad for for the United States. But the other thing, I'm and I'm sure other people feel the same way. But um, the other thing that occurs to me is that some people might be imagining, how could I do that too? What would your advice be to people to prepare themselves for something like a big move as you've undertaken? Well, the hard thing about moving overseas, especially for young people, is that even just the cost of going to visit and checking things out before your move can almost be cost prohibitive. Um, and so... If you're not able to afford visiting somewhere before you make the move, if you can just find someone who lives there, who can tell you know, who can send you links for local job postings, who can send you links for local flats for rent, it can almost make it so that you can save the money and just make that move. Um, and then, yeah, if if you if you want to work in a state approved job, you know, be sure to apply for your visa, uh, your work visa ahead of time in case it takes a long time to process. 
Um, if you're interested in New Zealand, um, they have what's called a working holiday scheme. Um, where you can apply to work for a year. And I don't know why, but like of all the visa applications, they process the working holiday visa the most quickly. Like I said, I had mine within a week. And if you're from the States, um, their working holiday slots are unlimited for Americans. Um, so yeah, that it, it wouldn't actually be very hard to make the move here. And I, of course, would be willing to hook you up. With yeah. Her and whomever. Well, what do you do... What do you do about personal debt, which is a big problem for people in their, you know, uh, mid-twenties, which is a big uh, demographic for looking at, at uh, alternatives? What, is that is that kind of weigh you down? Is it something you feel like you should, you know, clean up your personal finances before you even consider something like this? Um, the, the only debt that I hold a student debt, student loans, um, and I, I don't, like, you can get them deferred for, like, unemployment, and I am unemployed right now, and so every time you apply for deferment, it gives you six months interest-free, and you can do that for up to three years. Okay, good. So you're hoping and, that at some point you're going to get, a, you know, some liquidity and then be able to deal with that. Problem. Unless I can find a way out of it. Right. That would be, yeah. that would be ideal. <laughs> yeah. And what about possessions? You must have stayed light, uh, not accumulating yeah. a lot. I've been moving around so much ever since I left home when I was 18 that I don't actually own that many things. Um, and so I just brought what I could fit in two suitcases, basically just clothes and shoes. Mm -hmm. And so many places... You can rent furnished, you know, so you don't need to buy a bed and a bureau and blah, 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 blah. And so, you yeah. talk about in New Zealand, you can go to a place and there's the refrigerator's there, everything's there. Uh, everything. Yeah. I remember friends of mine moved to China and they said that in Shanghai, uh, uh, apartments come uh, even with not just furniture and things, but also paintings and even uh, chotskis on the shelves. <laughs> right on. <laughs> Well, um, it's been wonderful to talk to you, uh, Amanda, and, and so exciting to catch up with you. And I, something tells me, you know, I think of you as something of a, of a pioneer. You know, you're, you're a gutsy uh, woman, and what you've done is extraordinary and something of a sign of the times, and I wish you well. And let's please try to stay in, stay in touch, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful to visit with you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.